Friendship is the only cement that will hold the world together. Woodrow Wilson. Oh, hi. Mr. Lahasky here. And today, we'll look at the United States' involvement in the First World War, or as it was known at the time, the Great War. World War I was a global catastrophe. It ravaged multiple continents and left some 40 million people dead. But the broader World War I narrative is better suited for a world history class. The United States was a late entrant to the trenches, and while U.S. troops played an important role in tipping the scales for the Entente, our story today will focus more on where the Great War fits in America's story. We'll look at America's transition from a neutral nation to a belligerent. We'll see the government take increasing control of the wartime economy. And we'll examine how U.S. involvement in the conflict affected America's place in the global community. But before we do all that, let's ask a big question. Should the government tolerate dissent in times of crisis? The freedom of speech is one of the most cherished of all American liberties. For many, steadfast adherence to this freedom is what sets the United States apart. But how committed should we be to the First Amendment? Are there situations that justify limits to the freedom of speech? What if the speech puts American soldiers in danger? What if the speech threatens national unity in a volatile moment? What if the speech threatens the survival of the Republic? During the First World War, the First Amendment was tested and the Supreme Court ruled that certain limitations of free speech were appropriate and permissible. But did they make the right decision? Let's put the story in context, then you decide. World War I began in 1914, with the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne. And when Europe descended into war, most Americans were determined to stay out of it. However, between 1914 and 1917, a series of events drew the United States into the conflict. This is our first big idea. Americans' desire to remain neutral in World War I was slowly overtaken by the economic realities of the war and rising tensions between the United States and Germany. When the war began, the official American position was one of neutrality. As the Europeans dug in, American President Woodrow Wilson implored U.S. citizens to remain neutral in thought as well as in deed. In his 1914 State of the Union address, he remarked, Every man who really loves America will act and speak in the true spirit of neutrality, which is the spirit of impartiality and fairness and friendliness to all concerned. And most Americans agreed with this sentiment. The avoidance of European entanglements was a pillar of American foreign policy, one that traced origins all the way back to the Washington administration. However, remaining neutral proved more difficult than first believed. When the war began, the United States enjoyed healthy trade relationships with both Britain and Germany. But as part of the Allied war strategy, the British Navy established a blockade of the North Sea. This action effectively closed German ports to American merchants, and trade with Germany dried up. Now, the spirit of neutrality might dictate that Americans cease their trade with Britain until they were permitted to resume business with Germany. But the United States could ill afford the cessation of all European commerce, so trade with Britain and France continued, and in fact, it increased dramatically. The increase in trade volume with Britain and France slowly brought the United States closer to the Allied cause, since America now had a vested economic interest in their survival. Germany recognized as much and grew increasingly hostile to British and American vessels on the high seas. The Germans pioneered the use of submarines called U-boats and utilized them to devastating effect. In 1915, the Germans initiated the policy of unrestricted submarine warfare. The strategy involved the indiscriminate sinking of any vessel near the British Isles. The policy was intended to damage the British economy and weaken the ties between the Allies and the United States, but it didn't always have that effect. In May 1915, German U-boats attacked and sank the RMS Lusitania. The ship was en route to Liverpool from New York under the British flag 
when it was torpedoed without warning. The sinking of the Lusitania resulted in the death of 1,195 passengers. 128 of them were Americans. The tragedy marked an inflection point in American public opinion, which turned sharply against the Germans. Listen to this clip from a song recorded only 13 days after the ship went down. It captures the essence of the American reaction. Interestingly, the vocalist you just heard was born Albert Wiederholt, but changed his name to Herbert Stewart thanks to the rising anti-German sentiments in the United States during the war. After the Lusitania incident, President Wilson demanded an end to unrestricted submarine warfare, to which the Germans agreed for a short time. But the president found himself in an increasingly awkward position. On one hand, most Americans still did not favor military intervention. But on the other, the economic and political realities seemed to be inching the United States towards war. In 1915, Wilson authorized an expansion of the United States Army, which signaled that military intervention was a possibility of increasing likelihood. But when Wilson ran for re-election in 1916, his supporters championed the campaign slogan, He Kept Us Out of War. Wilson was re-elected on this platform, but early in his second term, he was forced to reverse course. Now, sensing that America might soon intervene in Europe with fresh troops, Germany hoped to keep the U.S. out of the European conflict, or at least delay its entry. In February 1917, a telegram from Germany to Mexico was intercepted, decoded, and released by British operatives. The message, known as the Zimmerman Note, encouraged Mexico to declare war on the United States. The Zimmerman note intensified anti-German sentiments in the U.S. Then, a month later, Germany defied Wilson's warnings and resumed unrestricted submarine warfare. German U-boats sank three unarmed American merchant ships in the Atlantic. Wilson could keep the United States neutral no longer. The U.S. declared war on Germany on April 6, 1917. When war was declared, Woodrow Wilson had to quickly shift his messaging. Since 1914, he had implored the American people to stay neutral. He won his re-election campaign largely on that plea. But in 1917, he had to then convince the country that the war was necessary. His justification is outlined in our second big idea. Woodrow Wilson framed the Great War as an ideological struggle between democratic and despotic forces. His 14 points outlined a vision for a post-war order that emphasized freedom and democracy around the world. We learned in our last lecture that Woodrow Wilson employed a foreign policy strategy that prioritized freedom and democracy and the spread of those principles. When the United States was thrust into World War I, Wilson maintained this idealism. He viewed the Great War as a struggle between the democracies of Europe and the tyrannical old world monarchies of Germany and Austria-Hungary. In his war message to Congress, Wilson declared that the world must be made safe for democracy. 
he argued that the future of democratic government hinged on the results of the Great War. Wilson truly believed that World War I could be the war to end all wars, and he also believed that he had the blueprint for future peace. In January of 1918, Wilson delivered a speech to Congress in which he outlined his post-war peace plan. Wilson explained 14 points, or 14 objectives that he believed would create harmony among nations and prevent future conflicts. You see, Wilson recognized that the complex web of alliances, both public and secret, helped to escalate World War I, so he proposed an end to secret treaties. Wilson wanted absolute freedom of the seas and free trade between countries, a jab at the blockades and submarine warfare that had drawn the U.S. into the conflict. He called for reductions in the size of standing armies to end militarism, and he wanted self-determination for colonies around the world, bringing an end to the age of imperialism. Wilson also called for cooperation among nations. His 14th point suggested the creation of an international peacekeeping organization known as the League of Nations. The League, Wilson believed, would create a forum for countries to solve disputes diplomatically rather than resorting to war. It was perhaps the most coveted of Wilson's 14 points. Of course, the 14 points was only a blueprint for the post-war order. And before any of that blueprint could be considered, the war had to be won. The American efforts to that end are the subject of our third big idea. The United States mobilized its entire economy in the spirit of total war. The government took greater control of American industries, increased taxes, and mobilized the American public. You may remember from your world history class that nations engaged in total war during World War I. Total war is when all of a nation's economic resources are dedicated to the war effort. This includes industrial resources, financial resources, and of course, people. In order to supply the U.S. and allied armies, the United States government took unprecedented control of the American economy. Factories that had once produced consumer goods were instructed to shift production to weapons, munitions, and other war goods. A new government agency called the War Industries Board seized control of these essential industries. And for the first time, the government actively supported organized labor. The government recognized that labor conflicts and strikes could stall the production of essential war goods. So the War Labor Board was created to encourage businesses to raise wages, improve working conditions, and negotiate with labor unions to avoid these stoppages. Of course, the war effort also demanded extensive financial resources, and the government turned to two main methods to pay for the war. First, they raised taxes. The graduated income tax, which had been established by Constitutional Amendment in 1913, saw rate hikes, and the government also added an inheritance tax. Tax revenue during the war totaled about $10 billion, but the lion's share of war funding was raised through the sale of government bonds. Branded Liberty Bonds, these were loans issued to the government by the American people, and they were responsible for over $23 billion in cash revenue. Food resources were also of paramount importance. As European armies decimated the fertile fields of France, the global food supply fell and prices rose. In order to manage the crisis, the United States Food Administration was established in 1917. Future President Herbert Hoover led the effort, which encouraged people to conserve food resources by practicing Meatless Mondays and Wheatless Wednesdays. Hoover also promoted home gardens known as Victory Gardens, which would help stabilize prices and supply by reducing the demand for food at the market. Hoover's campaigns were based on volunteerism, but many Americans answered the call, believing that their contribution to food conservation would make a tangible difference in the fight for freedom. But the most important resource that the government needed to mobilize was the American people. In 1917, the Selective Service Act established a draft for military-age men, and the government launched propaganda campaigns to encourage more volunteers to sign up. Women also played a large role. Some joined the military to fill secretarial and clerical jobs, 
and others joined nursing outfits. Even more women did their part by leaving home and filling factory jobs that were left behind by enlisted servicemen. Weapons and munition factories were staffed largely by women throughout the war. And this mass mobilization of the American people had consequences on migration patterns in the United States. The vacancies in northern factories triggered a wave of African-American emigration out of the rural South and into northern cities. More than a million African-Americans fled Jim Crow during the war. And the move had ripple effects. Mexicans in search of economic opportunity spilled into the American South to fill agricultural jobs that black workers had left behind. This cascading movement of people was known as the Great Migration. Now, getting soldiers into uniforms and getting weapons in their hands was a huge economic undertaking. But of equal importance was keeping the public engaged and enthusiastic about the war. This is our fourth big idea. The United States government sought to maintain support for the war through public information campaigns and restrictions on dissent. As Abraham Lincoln learned during the Civil War, total war can only be pursued to the extent that the public supports the effort. To that end, the United States government took drastic action during World War I. In order to unite the public behind the war and against the Germans, the government established the Committee on Public Information, a propaganda factory that encouraged Americans to enlist, work, conserve resources, and buy war bonds. World War I propaganda appealed directly to American sense of patriotism and duty, and it was effective. But like any war effort, the Great War also had its detractors. To curb opposition, Congress passed two consequential laws during the war. Both limited Americans' ability to object. The Espionage Act, passed in 1917, criminalized any obstruction of the American war effort, including the draft. The following year, the Sedition Act outlawed a number of expressions of free speech, including the utterance or print of any abusive language toward the United States, its form of government, or its military. Both laws imposed obvious restrictions on the freedom of speech, and they were challenged in court. In 1917, Charles Schenck was arrested under the Espionage Act after he printed and distributed pamphlets encouraging Americans to resist the draft. Schenck's attorneys argued that the defendant was exercising his freedom of speech and that that speech was protected by the First Amendment. But in a landmark decision, the Supreme Court disagreed. The court ruled unanimously that free speech could be restricted as a matter of national security and that any speech that presents a clear and present danger to the public is not protected by the First Amendment. The court's decision in Shank v. United States had far-reaching consequences. It effectively expanded the power of the federal government to restrict free speech under certain conditions, especially during wartime. Thanks to the public information efforts, as well as the restrictions against dissent, the American public remained largely supportive of the war effort. And in all, that robust support lifted U.S. forces to victory in Europe. In the summer of 1918, fresh troops under the command of General John Pershing helped to push German lines backwards until the Kaiser's government collapsed and an armistice was signed on November 11th. Of course, much work remained to be done. The terms of the peace treaty and the war's aftermath are outlined in our final big idea. Despite Wilson's advocacy for his 14 points, he was outvoted at the Paris Peace Conference by Allied leaders. And while Europe consented to the establishment of a League of Nations, the American people rejected the United States' participation in favor of a return to isolationism. With the German government at bay and a ceasefire in place, Allied leaders met in Paris to discuss terms of the peace treaty but the Allies did not share the same goals. Italian President Vittorio Orlande was mainly interested in territory. His country had switched sides early in the war, hoping to capitalize on the demise of the Central Powers. British Prime Minister David Lloyd George was mainly interested in punishing Germany for the long and costly war it had waged against the UK. 
having perhaps the most to complain about was George's Clemenceau of France, whose nation had been shredded by trench warfare. Clemenceau sought damages from Germany and tight restrictions on its future behavior. And then there was Woodrow Wilson, whose nation had been a late entrant to the war, whose people had suffered the least as a result of it, and who rolled into Paris with his 14 points, a vision for international harmony among nations. It's not hard to see why the idealistic Wilson was not taken seriously in Paris. His 14 points were largely rejected by the other members of the Big Four, who wanted harsher terms. The eventual peace treaty was signed at Versailles in 1919. The terms of that agreement were as follows. First, Germany was forced to accept full blame for the war, though they probably bore no greater responsibility than any other nation sucked into the conflict. Second, Germany was saddled with reparations to the tune of $55 billion. Of course, this was money that the defeated nation did not have. Third, the treaty held that Germany must disarm and would no longer be permitted a standing army. Now, the leaders at Paris did give President Wilson one concession. At his insistence, they agreed to establish the League of Nations as an international peacekeeping organization, though we should note they did so somewhat half-heartedly. Still, with the agreement in hand, Woodrow Wilson returned to the United States, but his work was not yet done. The Constitution empowers the Senate to ratify or reject treaties negotiated by the president. And while Woodrow Wilson believed wholeheartedly in the League of Nations, it was hugely unpopular in Congress. Senator Henry Cabot Lodge led the opposition in the Senate, arguing that the League of Nations was likely to suck the United States into future European conflicts. Many Americans shared in this concern. World War I had revealed the horrors of international entanglement, and most people favored a return to the isolationist posture of old. Wilson attempted to take his proposal for the League of Nations directly to the people by embarking on a nationwide speaking tour, a strategy that had worked for him when he wanted Congress to lower the tariff earlier in his presidency. Unfortunately for Wilson, however, the tour was cut short when he suffered a massive stroke that left him mostly incapacitated. Despite two attempts, the Senate never ratified the Treaty of Versailles, and accordingly, the United States never joined the League of Nations. This left the organization largely without direction. It was, after all, the brainchild of an American president who could convince neither his legislature nor his people of its value. In 1920, American voters expressed their desire to move on from the First World War, and also from progressive politics. They elected Republican Warren G. Harding, whose campaign slogan, A Return to Normalcy, invoked the memory of a bygone isolationist era. Of course, the emergence of the United States onto the global stage rendered such a return to normalcy impossible, but that's a story for another day. In the meantime, let's circle back to our big question. To what extent should we protect the freedom of speech in a time of crisis? The Supreme Court decided in Schenck v. United States that dissent against the government presented a clear and present danger to the American Republic. Was this an overreach? Should Charles Schenck have been permitted to voice his opposition to the draft? Or was his imprisonment justified? If it wasn't, how can we ensure that the freedom we hold most dear is not also the cause of our demise? If it was, where do we draw the line for what speech is protected? and what speech is not. This is all to say that civil liberties are only safe to the extent that our institutions uphold and protect them. They require consistent maintenance and periodic reevaluation, and that is the job of the American citizen, a job that will soon be turned over to you. Next time, we'll step into the roaring 1920s. See you then.